Hi, I'm J. Allen Sanford from the San Diego Reader, and we're here again to talk about another episode of the 1950s television anthology, Tales of Tomorrow. I've written about shows like this for magazines like Cult Movies and Starlog, Film Facts, and Midnight Marquee, and the Reader published my in-depth history of this program a while back. And that article included taped interviews that I conducted over 30 years ago with several of the show creators. And you can hear some of those in the other commentary tracks in this DVD set. This 20th episode of Tales of Tomorrow, Age of Peril, was broadcast live as it was performed on the East Coast on February 15, 1952. And the Kinescope version aired on the West Coast a couple weeks later on February 29th. Uh, which was leap year. That's why we had a February 29th. Our storyline takes place in the far-flung future of 1965, which was uh, about 13 years in advance of when this aired. And the United States has just perfected a nearly infallible lie detector machine. And they're talking about how this thing is supposed to be so accurate that uh, basically courtrooms and trials are hardly necessary anymore. If this machine says you're guilty, uh, you're going to go off to jail. And if it says you're innocent, then the law apparently can't touch you in this, uh, this strange world of 1965. The machine's inventor says, I'll read you a quote here from the, from the story. He says, quote, the day is coming when we won't need policemen or detectives or criminologists because there won't be any more criminals, unquote. And, and that really everything's all going hunky-dory until someone is caught basically red-handed stealing military secrets like uh, I think it's a top-secret R-8D missile data, is what they say, has been stolen from a, a high-security facility. And uh, this fellow here being played by Dennis Patrick, who just stood up, he's the fellow who's being hired to look into this. It's uh, the culprit took one of these lie detector tests, and uh, it said he was telling the truth about being innocent. So that, that's got them all baffled, and uh, they might have to let this guy go. So they brought Dennis Patrick in here to look into it. One character, we got our title for this episode from uh, a line from one of the characters here talking. He says, uh, our whole country is headed into, quote, a new age of peril in which the criminal will have the upper hand, unquote. Uh, which changes the title, actually, of the original short story, which was called Crisis 99. We're going to talk about that in a few more minutes. Uh, so when this episode aired in February 1952, it's kind of interesting to note that that phrase, age of peril, wasn't really something that was commonly heard. Wasn't a commonly uh, said phrase anyways. At least it wouldn't be until a couple years later after President Eisenhower said it during his May 9th, 1953 radio address. And uh, he, he used the phrase in that. He said, we live in an age of peril. And uh, I believe he said that again in uh, 1954 at the State of the Union address. So uh, this kind of predated that a little bit. They call in this national security expert, played by Dennis Patrick, as I mentioned, along with uh, this doctor slash scientist who invented the lie detector that we see here, and his lovely lab assistant daughter, Phyllis Kirk, is the actress who plays her. And uh, they need to help solve the mystery of how this uh, device that uh, he invented uh, is able to be uh, fooled by this obviously guilty foreign party who's able to beat this lie detector. And... Uh, well, it turns out that, that this thing is going kablooey all over the place. They're, they're talking now, I believe, about how uh, there are other obviously guilty criminals that are uh, popping up all over the place. Uh, uh, they, they take this test that this inventor made, and it's supposed to be infallible, and, and they're passing it. And uh, I think the Dennis Patrick character says that they've had to let 49 known spies go, or it'll be 49 once they uh, let this one go. So I'll tell you a little bit about the original story. Uh, it's by Frederick Brown, and he was one of the original writers that uh, allowed his stories to be contributed to the database that uh, formed the basis for the stories of Tales of Tomorrow. And uh, he wrote the story Crisis 1999 uh, that was originally published in the August 1949 issue of Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, which seems like a strange place for it, but I mean, it's set 15 years in the future. It's a sort of a combination sci-fi uh, mystery story. Uh, which was something that, that Brown was, was fairly uh, known for. He was a very prolific writer who wrote around 300 science fiction and mystery short stories beginning in the early 1940s. In 1947, he won the Edgar Award for the best first mystery for his story, The Fabulous Clip Joint. Uh, 
uh, and that was awarded by the Mystery Writers of America. He, he's actually, the, you may have heard of Frederick Brown uh, being famous for having written the shortest short story of all time, and that one is called Knock. It was published in 1948, and the entire story is actually only two sentences, and uh, I'm told that uh, it's okay to read it to you here. Uh, the, the, the story goes, quote, the last man on earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock at the door, unquote. And that's a heck of a story. Uh, Frederick Brown's stories were adapted for a lot of other early TV anthologies that were similar to this. Uh, we'll call them genre programs, uh, such as Dimension X. He wrote for that in 1950. He wrote for the Lights Out series the following year. Uh, wrote for some of the regular anthologies like Chevron Theater and Studio 57. He, several episodes of Alfred Hitchcock Presents were based on his stories, unsurprising. Um, including one he did script himself. He actually took a, took a few swings at doing that, uh, writing teleplays. He did that in 1959. He adapted his own story, Human Interest Story. And that's one about a reporter who's interviewing a man who claims to be a Martian. So again, that's kind of in, uh, in his wheel well, a little science fiction tilt there. Uh, that one actually was later remade for uh, that reboot they did in 1985 with the Alfred Hitchcock series. And... Uh, he actually, the, the, I think there's an episode of Tales from the Dark Side based on one of his stories, too. That I think they did the Giesen Stacks. I'm not sure of the year of that, probably 86 uh, or so. And uh, that's the one about the guy whose daughter has uh, creepy dolls that uh, they're living lives that seem to be mirroring uh, him and his family's lives. And uh, there's actually there's also a 1960 episode of Boris Karloff's Thriller that's based uh, on one of Frederick Brown's stories, Knock 312. And that's the one about a gambler who tries to get a serial killer to murder his wife. And uh, you, you may be most familiar with him, uh, or at least his work, for a 1967 episode of Star Trek. They actually based that episode, Arena, on a Frederick Brown story. And that's the one, of course, where Kirk fights the Gorn. So aside from Age of Peril, Frederick Brown's work provided the basis for uh, one other Tales of Tomorrow, the previous year's episode uh, in 1951, they did The Last Man on Earth, which is really kind of a misleading title since it's about the last two people on Earth, and they're left alive by invading Martians. Again, uh, Frederick Brown seemed to really like Martians. They used the last two humans on Earth in order to conduct human experiments on them. And uh, he, he was so uh, known for his Martians that if you remember that 1989 Randy Quaid movie, Martians Go Home, that was indeed based on a novel by Frederick Brown. So it was adapted for Tales of Tomorrow here by a fellow named A.J. Russell. And uh, he was already in his 30s at the time. He, he'd already written multiple scripts for just about all the other genre TV shows. And it's kind of surprising. This was his only other, his only Tales of Tomorrow Given that, I mean, he wrote for so many similar shows and, and anthologies. He wrote for The Clock in 1951. Uh, he did 11 episodes of Lights Out, which is uh, real similar to this series in a lot of ways, in, in a spookier vein, perhaps. Did 10 episodes of The Web, which is another occasionally supernatural mystery anthology series. And he did a couple of the Alfred Hitchcock Present series in 1956 as well. And uh, very versatile. He also... Uh, did a lot of comedies. He was a favorite of Jackie Gleason. Uh, Jackie Gleason hired him to write nine episodes of The Honeymooners, and he also worked on nearly two dozen episodes of The Jackie Gleason Show, the 1956-1957 era. And uh, a couple of years later, in 1959, uh, he did both The Sorcerer's Apprentice TV movie and the sequel that was called Art Carney Meets the Sorcerer's Apprentice. A.J. Russell also won an Emmy Award in 1957 for his writing on The Phil Silver Show, and he did one of the very first TV adaptations of Winnie the Pooh in 1960 for another anthology series called Shirley Temple's Storybook. And he also wrote for The Ed Sullivan Show, uh, soap operas like The Bold Ones, uh, General Hospital. So we're going to... Phyllis Kirk here, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the actress who plays the daughter. She's, of course, famous for having been the object of Vincent Price's twisted obsession in 1953's House of Wax. And she had her own TV show from 1957 through 59, playing Nora Charles in The Thin Man opposite Peter Lawford, uh, which actually got her nominated for an Emmy Award. Uh, also on TV, she did some of the anthologies like Suspense. She did The Web, Studio One, Climax, Playhouse 90, 
uh, all, all the anthology that were so prolific and popular in the 50s when TV was first struggling to fill programming. And uh, you probably best remember her from the 1960 Twilight Zone episode, A World of His Own. She plays Victoria West, and that's the nagging wife of the writer who can create people, uh, including another woman, just by dictating a description of them into this enchanted tape recorder. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the government investigator here, Dennis Patrick, standing there smugly looking at his, uh, his suspect. Yeah, he's from the United States Bureau of Scientific Investigation, an officer from, from that bureau. And uh, he's actually still, I think he's billed in this as Dennis Harrison. That was the name he was using. He uh, would change his name to Dennis Patrick and become probably best known as one of the original villains of the 1960s gothic TV soap opera Dark Shadows, playing Jason McGuire. He was one of, one of the original villains in the first season of that. He was also Von Leland in Dallas, and he turned up on shows like Fantasy Island, The Incredible Hulk, The Six Million Dollar Man, The Bionic Woman, Mod Squad, Ironside, Honey West, The Fugitive, just, just a ton of others. Uh, I remember him as Frenchie Lafont in the 1963 Alfred Hitchcock Hour episode, Terror at Northfield. And uh, he played a cop in the very final Tuesday Weld episode, The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, uh, called What's a Little Murder Between Friends? which I suspect was the basis for that much later TV movie reunion that was all about everyone in town trying to murder Dobie Gillis for a reward. So, uh, our machine inventor is played by an actor named John McGovern, and uh, he came from Rhode Island, near, near my own hometown, in fact. He lived for a while in Clinton, Connecticut, and uh, did a lot of the early TV anthologies as well, including some of the other genre shows we mention a lot, like, uh, such as Suspense, Inner Sanctum, The Web, and one called Out There. Uh, he was a mailman in The Birds. Comes and goes fairly quickly in that. He was in a few episodes of the original 1960s Defenders TV series with E.G. Marshall. And he sometimes did comedies. He was Commissioner Brady in a few episodes of Car 54, Where Are You? And a year after this, in 1953, John McGovern would be in another Tales of Tomorrow episode, one called Past Tense. And the director of that was the same director from this episode, Don Medford, we're going to talk about in a bit. And that one starred none other than Boris Karloff, and uh, you can actually hear uh, one of the creator's commentaries on that episode if you've got that DVD handy to play. And uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about one of the other... Uh, well, let's talk about Don, actually, because he, he, he directed 35 episodes of Tales of Tomorrow, and since the show ran a total of 85 episodes, I mean, that's a big chunk of the series. He was, at this time, just kicking off a career that would find him scripting nearly 100 TV shows, including five episodes of The Twilight Zone. He did Alfred Hitchcock Presents. He did the final episode of The Fugitive, which in 1967 was the most watched TV broadcast in history. He also did uh, three dozen episodes of the FBI. He did a couple dozen Berettas with Robert Blake. He did Dynasty. And uh, aside from being a director, he also occasionally scripted and produced the shows he worked on. The Twilight Zones he did are probably closest to the work that you'll see him doing here on Tales of Tomorrow, having helmed A Passage for Trumpet with Jack Klugman, The Genie Episode, The Man in the Bottle, The Mirror with Peter Falk, and Death's Head Revisited with the Concentration Clamp, Camp. Rather. Uh, he also did an hour-long episode from the 61, uh, uh, 63 era, rather, Death Ship. And uh, he did some films. He directed the 1964 feature-length version of The Man from Uncle to Trap a Spy. Uh, he did one of the uh, Mr. Tibbs movies with Sidney Portier, The Organization. Um, when I interviewed uh, Man Rubin, one of the producers here of Tales of Noir, he singled out Don Medford as really one of the most welcoming directors on the staff. And I'll read you a quote here of his. He said, quote, He was very good. He was always very visual, and he would plan out the concepts to move the cameras. I always felt very secure with him, and he knew exactly what to do with the scripts. There were other directors that didn't really want you around, unquote. And, uh, and that's really true. Don Medford would even invite some of the uh, writers to bring their girlfriends onto the set and help impress them. And uh, was, he actually lived to be 95 years old. He passed away in early 2013. He directed what was probably one of the very best tales of tomorrow's, uh, I consider, anyways, the Dune Roller. It's one of the desert island horror stories. That was in January 1952. And that one's about this flaming 
uh, hoop snake that rolls along with its tail in its mouth and, and looking for its victims to burn, which, which is not really seen on camera, unfortunately. They show it just depicted as lights flashing in the characters' faces, but the description is just so fanciful. And uh, a, geolo uh, a geologist uh, scientist, Bruce Cabot, he discovers that this legendary creature uh, called Ouroboros are found only there on Lightning Island on Lake Michigan. And they're actually sentient rocks that can merge into a circular shape and become ambulatory. <laughs> and at one point, they, they, you know, they kill his assistant. So that's based on one of the early novelettes by Julian C. May, a story called, Ju uh, called Dune Roller, which had just been published a few months previous in Astounding Magazine. And uh, the same story would have been the basis for the 1971 movie, The Cremators. Uh, but it, it wasn't uncommon. A lot of times these stories would appear in print and then mere months later would be adapted for, uh, for Tales of Tomorrow and some of the other uh, genre television shows. They were hungry for programming back then in the early days of TV. Don Medford also directed a, a really nice jungle-based episode of Tales of Tomorrow that was based on an original story by Frank DeFolita, who did several uh, other episodes of Tales of Tomorrow. He later became famous probably most for Audrey Rose. Uh, and they did an episode together called The Fatal Flower about two botanists who develop a man-eating plant. And uh, he also did, Medford directed The Bitter Storm. That features an angry scientist who isolates himself on a remote island. I, I guess there's a running theme there that he, uh, he has uh, scientists that are just either very bad scientists or very bitter scientists. And uh, so this one invents a machine that, uh, well... <laughs> I don't want to tell you too much about these shows because I don't know if you've actually gone ahead and played these yet. I, I presume that you played them all before playing these inventories, so uh, we'll, we'll keep some of those descriptions a little uh, less specific, a little more ambiguous. Uh, but I will tell you about one that he did uh, called The World of Water. Uh, just a little bit about it. The scientist in that one, he, he, he kind of falls in love with a sexy young waitress, and when she spurns him, that makes him invent what he calls a universal solvent that transforms all matter it comes into contact with into water, which, which basically is, is going to make the world come about, <laughs> the end of the world come about. So he had a thing about, in a lot of his episodes about the evils of science. It seemed to be a running theme with the series and with Don Mayford having directed so many episodes. Uh, that, that, that's why this seems to happen so much. Uh, he directed one called The Fatal Flower about a man-eating plant that becomes the subject of a shared obsession for a botanist and his assistant. They both fall in love with the same girl, and, uh, and they create this fatal flower that is exactly what it sounds like. It's uh, something right out of the, the little shop of horrors. Uh, he, he, he would sometimes do these stories where scientists are just complete dumbasses, like The Invader is a good example of that. That, that one's about a scientist who's he's old, and, and he's on a boat, and he, he, there's something crashes in the water outside. He doesn't want to go out himself, so he sends his son, who's clearly ill-equipped for this job. And uh, his dad makes fun of him because the, the son wants to be a writer. And uh, he sends the son out there. When the son comes back, something's not quite right. And uh, even the kid's girlfriend, Ava Kambora, can tell that something's not right. And uh, talking about bitter scientists, Don Medford directed one that was actually called The Bitter Storm. that <laughs> features a bitter scientist who isolates himself on a remote island. It's about to be hit by a hurricane, and uh, he hates all mankind. He thinks they've abused all of his discoveries, and they never gave him fair compensation. And uh, he, he's so suspicious. Don Medford's stories are, have people that are so suspicious of scientists. There's one called Youth on Tap. He directed that, I guess like, the title pretty much gives it away. A scientist is paying young people to uh, sell him years of their lives for himself. And... Uh, you know, I, I like, the, for Don Medford, he, he directed one that is, I, I think, one of the most philosophical, if not one of the strangest episodes. It's called The Horn, and it's, uh, it's one of several that are about scientific hardware, several episodes of the series, but this one, it specifically it interfaces with human emotion, and a violin maker, he moonlights as an inventor. He converts a French horn so that it uses sound to transmit the thoughts and feelings of the horn player directly into the brain of the listener, which effectively controls their emotions. And, and unfortunately, the device is sabotaged by a jealous failed musician, unfortunately, but unsurprisingly, since, of course, few fortunate events ever occur on Tales of Tomorrow. Uh, I could go on about Don Medford for quite a while. He did so many episodes, and we do talk about him quite a bit in other commentaries, but 
Uh, if you'd like to find out more about them and, and you've got a computer handy, you can find out uh, there's actually a master's thesis by his son, Jeffrey Wright. He wrote about his dad and about how his dad made the transition from live TV broadcast and videotape to film. And uh, that's fairly easy to find online. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the uh, security officer here that we're looking at, Donald Briggs, uh, is the actor who plays him. In the storyline, he's the last one to take the test uh, and effectively becomes a suspect by doing so. Uh, he, he's played by Donald Briggs, who'd been in films since the mid-30s. He'd done just about all the early anthology TV shows, including the genre shows, uh, like three episodes of The Web. Uh, he did a few episodes of Suspense. Uh, he was in a really neat little sci-fi show called Captain Video and His Video Rangers in 1955, which is really the antithesis of this show. That one was you know, more geared towards kids, whereas this was absolutely adult sci-fi. Uh, the year before this, in 1951, he was in another Tales of Tomorrow episode, one called The Dark Angel. And you can later see him in shows uh, like My Favorite Martian, The Fugitive, Wild Wild West, uh, he turns up in some comedic roles. There's an episode of Batman in 1967 called Caught in the Spider's Den. And he plays a character called Irving Irving in that. And uh, he was in Hazel. He was in a bunch of episodes of The Lucy Show in 1962, 1963. Uh, he played, you might recognize, he was Vivian's boyfriend. Eddie Collins was the character name. And uh, he apparently struck up a friendship with Lucille Ball. He was... Uh, involved in several other projects where he, one of the very final roles he did before he retired uh, in 1970 was a Here's Lucy episode. And uh, we don't get a chance to talk much about the show itself. We're always talking about the, uh, uh, you know, the creators and the, and the performers. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Tales of Tomorrow. Uh, it ran nearly year-round, actually, on ABC. Started up in August 1951. It ran through June 1953. And there were two seasons, as we mentioned, there were 85 half-hour episodes. They shot these at ABC Studio One in New York City, where they'd start rehearsals on Monday, and they'd perform it live for the cameras on Friday at 9.30 p.m. Now, at the same time as they'd be broadcasting it, the producers would shoot what are called kinescopes, and, uh, and that would be for the stations that were played at different times in the, the West Coast broadcast, for instance. Kinescopes basically involved pointing one of those Eastman recording cameras right at the TV set as the show was uh, being aired, as it was being performed and aired, and they film it basically right off the live broadcast. And uh, the show, as we mentioned uh, earlier in this commentary, they had a lot of name writers right from the start, uh, especially uh, the co-creator, uh, Ted Sturgeon, had a lot of terrific uh, people working behind the scenes. And now that our story is wrapping up, uh, I should tell you that if you didn't watch this story, uh, the hypnotizing turns out to be the twist at the end. The creator of the machine was hypnotizing people to not be criminals anymore, and that enabled them to food the, fool the machine. Neat little twist. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Tales of Tomorrow as much as I enjoyed watching it with you. And we'll talk to you again on uh, the next commentary track. And. Uh, we really enjoy doing these. I hope you like the transfers, too, that have uh, been provided for these. They're uh, taken from the best quality masters, even though they were kinescopes, as I mentioned. Uh, it's been a long time since these uh, digitized versions of the original films have been made available. Uh, and I think this is the first time that about a dozen of them have been made, been made available on DVD. And certainly it's the first time you're going to hear some of these commentaries, so I hope you're enjoying them.